Hello and welcome to the um, continuation of our EMS 2022 conference, uh, third Thursday European afternoon. <laughs> yeah, so hello to all of you. For some of you, it's good morning, for some uh, good afternoon, but uh, what is most important that we are here at the beginning of another session and um, that um, we have uh, in front of us one very exciting hours. Um, uh, talking about grading in-person and remote uh, assessment uh, faster and um, uh, started to work with, um, to, uh, with, with uh, uh, Crowdmark. And uh, here with us are Maggie Wood for, uh, from Crowdmark and uh, Beatrice Navarro Lameda. University College London. So um, thank you both for being here with us. And since it is the only presentation um, here today in this afternoon part, uh, I would give you the actually presentation um, in your hands and uh, uh, let, us, let us start. I, I presume that some of the participants will join us in a next couple of minutes, but um, it's better to, to begin and then uh, probably repeat or answer the questions in the, in the meantime. So please, Maggie and Beatrice, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, we're very happy to be here. Um, welcome. And uh, as Christian mentioned, there's a link for the Moodle environment for the session to place questions. And we've also dropped a link in there, which I will just copy and paste into the uh, chat again for everyone to see. So what that link is, is for you to provide your email address, because at the end of the session, what we'll do is we'll invite um, all of you into a Crowdmark demo environment where you can try it out for yourself. So uh, there's a form there for you to fill out to drop us in your email address. And then um, later on, we'll get to try that out. So, uh, my name is Maggie and I am one of the customer success managers here at Crowdmark. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Crowdmark before we get started in the demo. We have, um, Crowdmark is a, it's a grading and assessment platform that was designed and uh, the inception of Crowdmark came from James Colliander, who is an award-winning mathematician, was teaching at the University of Toronto and uh, they were grading one of the math competitions, thousands and thousands and thousands of pages being passed back and forth between a team in a locked room. Um, and he thought like, there's gotta be a better way for us to do this. And so uh, Jim and a couple other partners started building a software and Beatrice was actually at U of T at that time and uh, was in the very early testing stages with Crowdmark. Beatrice, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so back in 2013, they were still developing. It was very early on in the Crowdmark journey. And then we we're a group of PhD students and we were marking an exam with, it was a module with 800 students. And then we were all sitting in a lecture hall on a Saturday on our laptops marking. And then we would be like, oh, okay, there's a problem. And then, they would be like, okay, everyone, stop marking now. They would go, try to fix it. Said, okay, try again. And then we would go and continue. And then after that first marking experience, then they asked for our feedback and we started telling them, oh, we wish we had these or we wish we had that. And then they were implementing everything that we were telling them, like they were implementing it. So after a couple of years, more or less what you see in Crowdmark now, it like the bones, it's, it's there, it still looks very, very similar. And um, yeah, it was very, very exciting to be part of that, that journey. At some point they removed the features that all the markers loved. And then all the markers were like, we want a grade in grade bag. And then we were like, okay, I'm sorry, but you need to bring this back. <laughs> and it came back. <laughs> and you know, we, it's funny because I was telling Beatrice the other day, we still very much build based on what our instructors ask for. And so um, we're constantly looking for feedback from our users. We're very much a user-driven product. Uh, we're here to make educators' lives easier. We're here to make um, that conversation between student and instructor easier and quicker and more effective. 
And uh, that's a great segue because why don't I show you how, how we do that? I'm just pulling up my demo environment here. I'm going to click share. And let me just get this chat back open so that I can see it. Great. All right. So uh, diving right in, this is the Crowdmark dashboard. This is what you see when you first sign into Crowdmark. All of your courses live here. Um, we have some other functions here that live on the side and you can create courses from scratch or we do also offer an LMS or a VLE integration wherein you can um, sync course rosters and sync grades back right into your grade book. So uh, Moodle is one of the integrations that we do offer. I'm just going to click into our demo course here. And you'll see that we offer um, a couple of different types of assessment. So uh, there are two fully separate types of workflows on Crowdmark. One is online um, and one is paper in person. So the original inception of Crowdmark was to sort of um, digitize paper grading. As we've grown from there, we have this um, fully digital workflow that of course uh, in 2020 became one of the very uh, valuable tools that people started using around the world um, when uh, in-person learning became impossible. And so uh, what I'm gonna do is show you first our grading interface, which um, is the same between the digital and the paper assessment. And then once we get through that, I will show you uh, the differences between the paper and the digital version. So I'm just gonna click into our online math exam here. This was completed by students fully digitally, so they would have been remote. Um, and there is flexibility in this uh, for timing, students in different time zones, um, everything is flexible on the instructor's end and the student's end. In this grading interface, you'll see that uh, we had one multiple choice question that has been auto graded by Crowdmark. And then we have two other questions here that are being graded by a team. When you click into a question, um, they are divided by question uh, for ease of grading. Uh, if you click into question one, it's going to take you sequentially through question one across the whole assessment. Um, if you have more than one person working at the same time, which of course many of us do, you end up with uh, the system jumping you over each other. So you'll never land on a booklet that someone else is already working on. I'm going to click into question one here. And Beatrice, why don't you tell us a little bit about how we work these evaluations? So the good thing with Crowdmark is that we have the comment library is the best feature that Crowdmark has, in my opinion. So here, as you can see on the left, we have a list of comments and you can drag the comment and drop it into the box. So then it will appear directly there. So instead of having to retype every single time the same comment, which happens when you have a very large number of students, you just drag and drop the comment. And the comments have points attached to them if you want to. So when you put a comment with a certain point value, it would automatically generate the mark for the student. This is very helpful because when you're marking especially questions that have several parts, then you can just say part A, this many points. The way I do it is that I create my marking scheme directly through the comments. So if this mistake corresponds to losing these many points, because we also have uh, points that value that are negative. So you could have a negatively valued comment. I don't know if uh, you have one there, but if not, then I can. Um, there yeah, is one there. There. So it depends on how you want to mark. In my experience, questions are relatively easy that most students get right, but you know that there will be a few points where they will make small mistakes, or you know that they're going to get all right up to here, and then they'll make a mistake here, and then that's it then if you do negatively valued comments, it's excellent because you just drag and drop that comment there and it takes the points off. Why is this so helpful? If you have a team of, let's say, two, three markers, if you have 1,000 students, one person marking everything will be a lot. It will be too many hours. So this way you can have a team of two people, for example, and it remains extremely consistent. Even when it's just one single person, I'm sure you've all experienced 
that you're marking a very, very large number of scripts. And eventually you get tired, you are not in as good of a mood as you were at the beginning, and your mood will have an impact on your marking decisions. Something that was like, oh, it's okay, it's not too bad, I'll take only two points off. Then after 500, it's like, oh, again. And then you might end up taking like four points off instead of two. With crowd marking, you do all the marking through comments. It is one mistake, cost you these many points, no matter if it's the first person I march or it was the number at thousand. You always use, whenever you see that comment, you just, that mistake, you put that comment in and that's it. You know it's going to be consistent, which is very easy to justify to the students that okay, you made this mistake, you got this comment, you lost these many points. There's no doubt about you being consistent. But even more so, I'm sure it's happened to you that, that you marked and when you are done marking, you realize like, oh, maybe I was too harsh. Maybe I was taking too many points off for this mistake and now the marks are too low. Traditionally, if you mark on paper, there's only two options. You ignore the problem or try to fix it by scaling all the marks up, which is not very fair. Or you have to go back and check all the scripts and change the marks manually. Here in Cardmark, you can go to the comments library. You just change the mark associated to that comment in the comment library. And magically, all the times that comment was used, the point is going to be changed. So that means that you could change the marking of 300 scripts with just one click. Grammar will tell you, will give you a warning saying that you're going to be changing this marking for all these scripts. And then you know that it was used 200 times, it will be changed 200 times, and the mark would be updated automatically, which I absolutely love. After this feature was introduced, my instructions to uh, postgraduate TAs that are marking exams is you're only going to mark via comments because if something goes wrong with the marking, you can fix it very easily. Another thing that I find is sometimes it's very difficult to come up with helpful feedback. And you, you know that you have a limited amount of time, you write a comment, but then maybe after you've done a couple of hundred or even 20, 30, you realize that the comment that you wrote is not the most helpful and you would like to change it. Again, with paper marking, the only way to change the comments is to go back, find that paper, scratch it and write something again. With Crowdmark, you can go to the comment library, you search for that comment by typing any word in that comment, and then you can edit the text and it will be updated in all the instances when that was used. So it will really, it does two things. It makes marking faster, but it also makes it better because you can improve the quality of feedback that you give to the students. You may have also seen as we've been adding comments here that the comments are fully marked down and LaTeX friendly. So you are able to put in equations, you're able to drop in something like a graph, um, you're able to drop in links to, uh, you know, class resources or external resources to help those students who might need a little extra help. Um, and there's all kinds of different options here. Um, the other thing is, as Beatrice says, she creates these uh, beforehand, you can also build your library on the fly. So if you come in here, and you're thinking, okay, uh, this is correct. Let's say you can add points or not. Let's add a point here. When you save it, two things happen. A point is added at the side, and then it also drops it in your comment library. So you can now continue using this comment through the rest of question one in this assessment. Um, so coming back to the points, the way that this works is, uh, is we generally recommend either using negative points or positive points. If you use positive points, this is going to start counting up from one. If you use negative points, it's going to start counting down from four. So uh, we know instructors like to work some work either way. We have the option of doing both. Um, you also have 
uh, some tools here. The default tool that you get dropped on is your hand annotation tool. So that works like a pen pencil. We have a lot of instructors who like to grade on tablets using the hand annotation tool. You can change the color of your pen if you prefer a red pen. We have checks, X's, and question marks that you can use as stamps. We have a highlighter tool as well if you'd like to highlight part of the student's work. And then our uh, rubbish bin here which you can hover over anything you don't want on the page and click to delete. So on the right hand side, as we continue here, you'll see we have our manual grading. We can uh, override the automatic one with some manual points if we like. And we also have tags. Beatrice, how does your team use tags? So the tags, especially a very important when you have a team of markers because then you can tell them, okay, if you don't know what to do about this script, don't worry. You create a tag and you write check. Or um, sometimes they are suspecting some plagiarism. We use these, for example, we tell them whenever you see these answer, that looks weird. If you see two that are identical, create the same tag. For us, it used to be a color and an animal, but it doesn't have to be. So all the identical answers would be, I don't know, blue dog. And then, then you would filter through the tags and you will only look at the scripts that had the tag blue dog. And then you can look at them next to each other to see if indeed it looks like they were copying from each other or from some other source. Or if you want to check something, you can go to the tags again, you click for the ones that are full review to check and you're filtering only those. And uh, sometimes you just want to come back to something later. So you can also create a tag, come back later, and then you check those. Another very good feature, actually, from the comment library is that you can filter script by comment. So if you go to the comment library and you click here, it says used one time. If you click on it, it would take you exactly to the place where it was used. And then you can filter next so you can see more of them. So actually, let me do the following. I'll add, I'll mark some other script. We'll use um, same comment. And then we'll see, for example, okay. Yeah, Maggie, if you go to the comment library, now we should be able to see the two correct routes was used two times. You need to, yeah. And then you click that, you will see that you have that in one out of two, and then you go to next filter, and then you would see the next one where that uh, comment was used. This is very helpful because maybe you want to double check what happened, what went wrong, and it will give you an idea of really what's going on. You can also download a comment library. I love that. And when you download it, it tells you how many times a comment was used. And that is helpful for two reasons. You can use it to give feedback to your students, a general feedback. So at the end of exams, many universities ask you to write a general feedback. Well, if you know that you have 300 students and a comment was used 172 times, that was a problem. There was a common issue there. So you can tell the students, well, most of you struggle with these. Or you can use it also to inform your teaching practices. Maybe next year you know that you need to emphasize that topic more because that was a very common issue. So with the um, both the tags and the filters, uh, the other thing you can do, as especially as a lead instructor, is filter by team member. Or as Beatrice mentioned, if there's something that a team member has asked you to review, you can come in and filter for that. Once someone else has placed an evaluation on a page, you have two options as a lead instructor. You can take what they've done and add to it using a clone and edit, or you can add a whole new fresh evaluation if you just want to scrap what that uh, team has done. This is also what um, teams use for double blind grading. We have different permission levels in Crowdmark, and instructors and facilitators can see the evaluations of others by default. Graders come in blind and only if they're uh, given permission to see other people's grading 
do they actually see it? So in this case, if I was a grader, I would see that Beatrice had graded this, but I would not see what she actually put. So that gives me the ability to then add a fresh new evaluation and put that double blind evaluation on there. Then when the review happens after the fact, whichever one is selected as the primary evaluation will be the one that shows to the student. So you have the option of showing any of the evaluations placed on that page um, to be able to show the student uh, the one that is better for them. Um, I'm just looking at my list here. The other thing uh, that happens when uh, you have a team of people grading is that you end up with statistics on who is grading what and how quickly and uh, how many pages or sorry, how many booklets, which is what we call scripts, have been edited or have been evaluated. So you'll see here on each question, it'll tell you which graders have been in there. If you click into your team tab, you're given statistics on time spent grading, as well as um, how many evaluations that instructor has placed. So this is super useful. Beatrice, I know you use this a lot with your teams. Yes. So it helps you get information about how long it takes to mark a particular question. So what I do, I try to collect that information from, you know, at the end of the exams, I create a spreadsheet and then I know this question took this many hours to mark uh, with this speed or this marker, you know, it's, it's very fast. Maybe sometimes you need someone that's fast and then you just put them there and someone is maybe very, you know, pays lots of attention, is very accurate, but maybe slower. Maybe you want to put them in a certain question where you want to be, you know, very accurate and you are okay with that person being a bit slower. So you can make decisions about how to allocate your resources based on this information. It is extremely helpful also when I have a team of markers, I ask them to mark the first 20 booklets. And then after they've done the first 20 to let me know that, okay, I've marked the first 20. Can you please check that you are happy with it? This ensures that you as a lecturer know what the, you know, the TA, the postgraduate TA is doing. And you can say, okay, it's good, continue or not. And well, redo it. But also gives you an idea of how long the job is going to take. The first 20 are slow because you are trying to decide how to use your comment library. But after you've done the first 50, you tend to reach the speed that you're going to do for the rest of the marking. So what you can do is after 50, you check, okay, what's your speed? How many booklets you have left to mark? Well, I expect it's going to take you 20 hours, but well, you are going to be paid only for 15 hours. So we have a problem there, but there are five extra hours that you either need to find the money for, or you decide, well, I need to readjust the way we mark to be able to stay within that number of hours, or I need to get help from someone else, or I need to do it. But after 50 booklets, you pretty much know how long the task is going to take, which is extremely helpful when you have a very large team, because sometimes you felt that a question is going to take 20 hours and then you realize like, actually, no, it's going to be more like 12. And then another question is going to be 10 hours and you realize it's going to be like 20. Maybe you swap the markers or, or you do something that to try to adjust and stay within reasonable hours. In Canada, this was particularly important because TAs are marked by the hour and the rules were very strict about that. In other universities, the rules about how many hours everyone spends are not as strict. But it's just to be fair, if you're paying two TAs for 20 hours of work, then you don't want one to be marking for eight hours and another one for like 35, right? You want to try to spread the workload in a reasonable way. 100%. Um, in the students tab of the assessment, there's also a wealth of information here. Uh, we can see here that we have um, submissions from students. Let's go see if we have one where we have. Nope, that's a paper assessment. You want one these already marked? I want one where I can show the students' submissions, which should be here. Let's check. So what we end up with in the status column when the student is submitting online, 
when you click into the status column, this will actually show you the uh, status of the student submission. So as you see, these all say not viewed um, because we cloned this assessment into here. Uh, that it will say viewed, it will say started, um, it will say submitted, it will say submitted late, and you have a full view of how your class is working in an online submission. Then for each submission, you're given this full log of every action that the student took in the assessment. For image submissions, you're given an MD5 hash that guarantees that if for some reason the student was unable to submit, we know students have connection issues all the time. If they send you their work some other way, as an instructor, you have the ability to go in and submit on the student's behalf. Using this MD5 hash, this is a unique hash that is placed on any file that's created by a computer. And you can guarantee that the file that student's sending you to submit is that same handwritten image file that they were trying to submit during the exam and not just something they created after the fact. You'll see that we've answered all the questions, we've clicked submit. Um, we have a submission time logged entry that tells you what is used for any calculations of lateness penalties. And then your accommodation options also live in this area as well. So as we mentioned, timing flexibility for students, if you have students who with academic accommodations related to time, the customized due date is available here. We also have what's called a timed assessment, which is a time limited, you only get one hour type assessment. Um, if a student has, you know, they get double time or they get 1.5 the amount of time, you can set that here as well. And then to add or remove a lateness penalty on a per student basis is also done here. And if we do that, let's say this student had an extended due date, what happens is you end up with a uh, gear option here to show you that this student has an accommodation option enabled. Um, to submit as an instructor, you can come in here to the student's submission. And this is what it looks like on the student side. So they're given um, their due date at the top. Once they've submitted, they have this availability. Um, the students are timed when they work. So they have a timer that lives here that counts down either to the end of their time or to the end of uh, the due date, if it's not a timed assessment. And they have the ability to edit and resubmit as long as there's time left on the clock. As an instructor, you have the ability to edit and resubmit at any time. So if the student has sent you work, you can click this edit and resubmit button, and then you'll be going in and submitting in the same way that that student was able to. You'll see also, working on here that our online assessments have three different question types. So the first one is our image or PDF upload. This was sort of the original online workflow for Crowdmark. This allows for handwritten work. Um, it allows students to submit on any device that has a browser and an internet access. So they can create handwritten work and snap a picture with a mobile phone. They can scan it. If they're working on a computer or tablet, they can take a screenshot, create a PDF, all that is uploadable in an image PDF question. We have text questions where the student types their answer directly into Crowdmark. And this section is also marked down in LaTeX friendly for the students. So that means two things. Number one is that students can start using Markdown in LaTeX to uh, put in equations, et cetera, in their answers. And number two means that they can attach files on this side that will then be downloadable for the instructor on the other side. So if they're using a CSV data set, for example, something that you need to take a look at, but not necessarily evaluate fully, that would be available to attach in a text response question. And then of course we have our multiple choice questions, which are set up um, for students and fully auto graded by Crowdmark. We'll resubmit that here. And then you'll see we've switched up to our submitted. And if we go in here, you can see we didn't make any changes, but we did submit again. Beatrice, have you used the submission log a lot? Yes. Uh, actually, we've been having online exams. And then students, they tell you, oh, I had a problem. And then you can go and see, OK, you opened the exam at this time. Maybe they opened it late. We don't know. Um, we can see when they uploaded their work. 
So sometimes students, they said, oh, I had a technical issue. And then you can go to the activity log and then you can check, well, all the files were actually uploaded on time. The problem was with the click submit, for example, some students forget to click submit. It has happened several times. But then if we can verify using the activity log that all the files were uploaded before the deadline, then there's no problem. I can go click submit for them and I can remove the lateness penalty. So Proudmark, you can set a lateness penalty to be applied automatically, but you can remove it if, if you decide that the student shouldn't get that lateness penalty. We can also see, for example, if a student uploaded, I don't know, the answer to four questions on time, but then the last question they uploaded late. So maybe you could make the decision of, Let's accept the work that was uploaded before the deadline, but not the one that was uploaded after the deadline. But that's something that you could decide to do if that's within the rules of your institution to accept partial work. So there are several things that you can do with the activity log. I had once the case of a student who had some error, some technical error, and then they sent me the file and actually was able to use the MD5 hash to <laughs> verify that indeed they were sending in the exact same file and not some small modification of the file that they actually uploaded. Now it's actually very easy because if the students upload a file, as long as there is not an upload issue that I was actually uploaded, you can click submit and it just gets submitted and then you can mark it. So you don't need the student to later send you the file again and verify it. It leaves there, you just click submit for them. And, and the problem will be immediately solved. So yes, we, we use that quite a lot. Also, you can, if you sort the students by status, it will sort them also by submission time. So you, will, you could get all the ones that were late at the top. So that will, and it says late next to the submission time. That means that you can very quickly go through all the ones that were late. If you have a grace period of, I don't know, a minute, two minutes, five minutes, whatever it is, then you can very easily there check, okay, all the students in this block submitted within 10 minutes of the deadline. So we can just remove the latest penalty automatically. That's what you decide to do. You decide to have some sort of grace period. Important thing, students get notified when they submit after the deadline. A student cannot tell you, oh, I didn't know they do get notified and they are told that they're going to get these lateness penalty. So if a student submits after the deadline and the lateness penalty was 100%, they will get red letters saying, you're submitting late, this is the lateness penalty. So students can all say, oh, I actually didn't realize I was uploading late. <laughs> they do know that they are doing it. So if they have a problem, they can contact you immediately to tell you, well, this happened. And um, well, if you decide that they need some special accommodation or some adjustment, you can do it. Or, or maybe you know and you don't accept it, but at least everyone has that information. Exactly. This is useful across the board. The students also have access to the same submission log on their end. So they're able to see their, all of their things. Um, they're able to see any upload failures or anything like that is all logged. They can, also, they can see it. They can make sure everything went through properly. Um, so that's a very comprehensive overview of the um, online assessment. There's one more thing. Okay. Grid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we don't want to miss that. Here, oh. overview grid lives here, or it also so lives in the grading interface. So then you can see which questions have been marked, the marks that you assign to each student. You can see those marks if you are allowed to see other people's markings, if you're an instructor, a facilitator, or a grader that is allowed to see other people's marking. If you are an instructor, you will see the email addresses. So that could bring some problems you want to keep the marking anonymous but if your role is set as a grader you will not see any email addresses so you will only see the numbers and what was marked and what was not marked one reason to do this is it gives you a very quick overview of the marking process how things are going 
And when you're marking a lot and you, you want to maybe have a visual indication of how much you have left. So you just go and scroll and say, okay, I have these many blanks that I have to, to complete. Um, so this if you want to check also, that everything was marked, you can see it there very easily. Yeah, uh, exactly. And you can also click in to any of these and it will take you directly to that question on that page. And uh, again, good segue because that also exists in the um, paper grading workflow. Yeah, and also, can you go back to the Bruggy grid? I want to, I did something so people can see something yep. that happened. So you see, if there was a mistake in the marking, and for some reason, someone enters a mark that is higher than the maximum number of points, it shows in a different color. So green means that it was marked and that the mark is within the allowed range. Anything above the maximum, then you will see it here in like orange. So it tells you, okay, there is a problem there. You need to go and check. So this is very important when you finish marking, just go and look that everything looks green. Anything that is not green is bad for you. All good? Great. Okay, let's try this again. So clicking into the paper exam, very similar uh, workflow to how the um, online grading works. The difference is in the setup. So when you set up a paper exam, what you do is you upload a template to Crowdmark. We of course have instructions on how, how to create those templates with specific margins. And what Crowdmark does is uh, Crowdmark places a QR code on each page of the assessment. And what that means is you end up with a cover page, your QR coded workbook. We also have an option for multiple choice bubble sheets, which can be added, will be added at the end of the booklet. Every page has a unique QR code. Um, and when you go to scan these into a PDF file to upload after the fact, it doesn't matter what order they're in. It doesn't matter uh, if they have you know, if you have two different versions, for example, of an assessment for academic integrity, and you're mixing them all together because everyone was in one room, when you upload those, the QR codes allow Crowdmark to route everything to the correct place, and it's going to be in the right place for grading. So the way that we manage that um, on the creation end is that once you upload the template, you come into this section and you actually label the questions and where they exist. And the grading area for that question will go from where you place the question label to the next question label. So even if it's across pages, you'll be able to annotate all the way down. You, of course, have control over question labels, points. We have a bonus option. And this is the same as in the online workflow as well. As I mentioned, uh, the grading works very similarly. Um, once you've uploaded your files, there are two options. So there is an auto matching option that uses optical character recognition to match the students with the booklets on, uh, on the, that, with the information that is in your Crowdmark course. And then there's the manual matching option, which looks like this. The student will have written their name here, student ID here, and then you would simply search for a student based on their email address and be able to select which student that is. So once we have everybody matched, or if you want to go through and grade anonymously, you can match after the fact. It's completely uh, separate. What happens is you end up clicking in, and the very same thing happens as uh, your digital uh, interface that we looked at previously. So you'll see the QR codes at the top here, your question one grading area, goes all the way down here. You'll see that we have some um, responses in here already, and we're able to create comments on the fly. So I think this is actually the, uh, the one we wanna use for demos. If um, everybody has placed, if everybody's ready, if we've placed our email addresses in the uh, demo assessment link, or if anybody has not, now is the time. And our team will get everyone in there and you can start clicking around. 
in the demo course um, and grading the sample exam. And then once we do that, we can take a look at what the results look like, uh, grade distributions and multiple choice analytics. While we wait, I can tell you a little bit about our multiple choice bubble sheet workflow. This is really great for uh, something that might replace something like a Scantron. Um, we do have a lot of instructors. What they'll do is they will print a template that is only a cover sheet on one side and a bubble sheet on the other. They'll distribute the questions completely separately. And then the students just fill in their bubble sheets. Those single page double-sided all gets scanned into Crowdmark. And then that's all auto graded by Crowdmark as well. So uh, once you are, um, once you have everyone in, everything's auto graded. If you uh, have a couple of responses that Crowdmark has said, I'm not sure what this is, you're able to fix those. And then you can match the booklets and distribute the grades almost right away. That's something actually that many people were concerned when we were doing online exams and then we were having Crowdmark and then everyone in mathematics and most people in mathematics wants to go back to in-person exams. And many are like, oh, but can we have in-person? But keep marking online with Crowdmark. Yes, you can. And the technology is very stable. Uh, the first time was using it was in 2013. It was used with a real university course. It was done using these same QR codes. The printing, you just need to, you get, so Crowdmark generates a very large PDF file because each page is unique. So you cannot just print one and make photocopies. You really need to print large file, but it is not that difficult. You just need to print it and staple every 10 pages or every as many pages as you know, your exam has. Um, so here Maggie is showing us an example of the way it would look. So you see this one has three pages. So you would keep the same three pages over and over just with a different QR code. And it's of course they wouldn't have the responses in them normally either. Yes. <laughs> just for you this to is our sample assessment. <laughs> so there's also the Crowdmark app where if you are invigilating or in a room, you can use it to match the papers as you go. So usually you would check the student ID and see that you know the person who is there is the person that corresponds to that university ID. So you could use your phone to scan the QR code and then match that paper to the student right away. So when they leave the room, you know that everyone was matched. This also helps to ensure that all the numbers match. So when we had a room with more than 300 students, we would do a head count. We know that we have these many students and no one can leave the room until we know that the number of papers matched in Crowdmark agrees with the number of people in the room. And in our case, we had several rooms. So one person from an office that had nothing to do with the building where the exam was taking place could check everything that was matched that we just needed a text message telling them okay there are this many students in this room and then you could check very well what happened if everything is, is working properly or not and you can always if there is some people that are writing the same special center because they have some special accommodation due to some form of disability they need some some special room you can send a small group of papers to them and then they can print them and and just have that bit of it um, done separately. I'm just checking in with my team if we have all of our team members added. And if so, you should be able to click around that demo course. Um, the sample exam is here with all the submissions for you to click into. So yeah, I see, see lots of people. So what you can do is the this assessment, the one that's called IMS, um, sample exam, just pick a random number, uh, I don't know, your favorite number, there's 156 that you could mark. So if you choose a number at random, you could avoid redoing one that someone has already done. Um, so here, uh, Mike, could you click in question one? 
So this is something that's very good as well. If you go here, you will see where it says booklet. You said booklet one, that's the one that you're currently marking. But if you click there, you can then go to whichever booklet you want to go to. So you type, I don't know, 23, and it will take you there directly. So that means that it's a lot easier for you to navigate the marking. Something we also have keyboard shortcuts that make that work quite short as well. Um, a lot of our maths instructors swear by these, especially when I am you're one grading. Of them. Yeah. <laughs> especially when you're grading something like a quiz or something quick where there's not a ton of feedback that's going on the page. Even um, when it's hitting, quick. Um, it is. Sorry, it is, I, it is. go ahead. Yeah, I think it just worked extremely, extremely well. Um, it has the feature of skipping. So you go to the next ungraded. So if something was not submitted, Crowdmark will just skip it automatically, which is very good because instead of seeing a, a blank that doesn't correspond to anything, it just skips it. So that way you don't assign a zero to someone who was absent. It just stays blank, which is very different from, from a zero. And also when you're using the common library, you could click on V. So V would generate the comment. So we'll open the comment option. Then you click, and if you type the first three characters of a keyword in the comment, it will show in a drop down menu. So here, for example, we have one. You probably have to refresh the page because it was just added. Yeah. I was just about to say that. So if it doesn't happen, you have to refresh the page. Um, then if you do that, you can do. Uh, for example, doesn't want to work. You have to today. do the first one. <laughs> Mixing steps. <laughs> it should work. Let's try refreshing again. Page, right. <laughs> so what what should be happening here is that this would show in a drop down menu, so that you don't have to click over here, you don't necessarily have to find the comment in the library, you're able to type start typing a keyword, and it'll drop down here, you can hit enter, and that will save that comment. So what I do to make my life easier, I don't like much of the using the mouse and clicking and going back and forth. So what I like doing is my comments when I create them, I create them with keywords in them. So the keyword doesn't even have to be the first word, it could be anywhere. And then I just type the first three characters of that keyword and then it tells it takes me directly to where I want to be. So it just makes the workflow a lot faster. You can also rotate the pages. Sometimes students upload the files that are upside down or sideways and you don't want to be doing this. So if you click R, it will rotate the page. You can also do it there, but with R, it's a lot quicker. <laughs> and it will just rotate the page for you um, automatically. So there are lots of these features that really make the marking a lot quicker and very pleasant to do. So uh, one of my colleagues just asked a great question here is that are the colleagues shared, or excuse me, are the comments shared with the team? So as you build a comment library, you have options to toggle on sharing that comment with the team to use, or um, you have the option of keeping your library separate and using uh, only the comments that you have created. So um, a lot of times instructors will create a comment library ahead of time to share with their team and say, I know Beatrice, you're very fond of like, these are the comments you're gonna use. <laughs> Um, and then if this, if they have freedom to create their own comments as well, they have the option of sharing those with the team. And it's not all or nothing. You could have a set of comments that are shared and a set of comments that are not shared. So I usually try to share the ones that I know I want to use a lot. But then sometimes you want to add a bit of clarification or extra comment to what you're doing. And those you don't need to share. Those could be you know, more personalized and those are the ones that are more, okay, this is what you did and this is how. So I try to have 
two types of comments. The comments that are used as a marking scheme to attach you know, points to papers. And then another set of comments, which is the one, okay, this is what you did, or this is how I'll help you when it's formative feedback. If it's a final exam, well, you don't need those comments, but if it's a midterm or, or a problem set, any type of coursework where you want students to learn from what they did, then I try to have those two different sets of comments. Um, the TAs don't share the ones that are more specific to what they're writing for that particular student, but we do share the other ones. And a great way to use that as well is if you have a rubric that you're working from, you can build the rubric requirements and associated point values right into the comment library. So those can be dragged and dropped onto the page. And then as Beatrice mentioned, you can also write personalized comments as you go. Um, I see we're sort of entering the last 10 minutes or so of the presentation. Do we want to start in on some questions from our Moodle environment? Yes, uh, thank you. Let me just check uh, on question. Yeah, there is one question here. If a marker finds an error in their marking, sometimes it happens, right? After grading was done, can we go back and remark all papers questions for the same mistakenly graded question uh, and update only those? those? Yeah, so there are um, a couple of different options for ways you might want to do that. One would be the one that we already spoke about, which is editing the comment in the comment library. If there's like a point error or uh, a comment error where you're like, oh, that comment's not right, you can edit that in the library and it will edit it across every time that it was used in the assessment. So even if it was used a thousand times, it will edit it across the whole thing. The other option is in filters, you have the option to filter in many different ways. So you can filter by question. If you're like, oh, my grading on question two wasn't great, I can filter by question two. You can filter by team member if you're a lead instructor and you need to look over one team member's work. Or if you're thinking, oh, everyone I gave a zero to, I should maybe change that. You can go through and filter by score as well and just go through those booklets that had those applied. So these filters are, are useful across the board. Yeah, what is probably- One more the possible scenario. Sorry. Sorry. And it's that you realize that you use a comment, right? But then you realize that the comment was right, but it was applied to some wrong student, right? That's it could right. be that it was correct for 100 of them, but then maybe for 50 of them, it was not correct. So you can at least filter by comments. So you will only look at the ones that had that comment in, and you can very quickly go through those and then remove a comment for those that shouldn't have got that comment. Mm. Okay, I have one, um, one additional question uh, here. Can an instructor add a test grader or test uh, a test student? Thinking of in uh, thinking of uh, impersonating those uh, roles to see what they see. Absolutely, we often encourage instructors to add themselves as a student to their course or add themselves uh, as with a second email account as a grader or with different permission levels to go ahead and test those. Um, that's always a great idea. Adding yourself as a student also gives you a toggle, handy toggle in your profile. Let me show you what this looks like. Uh, gives you this handy toggle up here where you can toggle right through from the instructional team to the student interface. And you can actually go ahead and see, I'll click over here just so we can see, exactly what the students see when they sign in. So the students have that same listing of all their courses, anything they've accessed recently lives here, upcoming due dates are over here. And then when they click into their assessment, this is what they see um, along with the submission log here. Mm. And you said that it can be integrated with LMS. That's correct. So uh, LMS or VLE integrations um, include on our side, uh, Moodle, Blackboard, Brightspace D2L or Canvas. We've also worked with Sakai. And if you if there's a you know a, a different one that hasn't been mentioned, um, we always have the ability to, to work something custom. Um, and what the integrations allow you to do is uh, sync your course roster right from the um, LMS slash BLE, or uh, allows you to also um, sync back the grades right into the grade book. Thank you. Um, I cannot see any additional questions here on, and in the Moodle, there is nothing else. So I think that we spent really um, uh, interesting one hour 
uh, on on this uh, presentation and I would like to thank you Maggie and Beatrice on your uh, interesting presentation and yeah we have one question here Robert Leek uh, yeah yeah I do see one additional one in the chat as well yeah, so Robert yeah, go yeah. ahead now and then we'll get yeah, to that now one. it appears yeah when we are near the end yeah please of course. Go. Um, I asked the Moodle, but I'm not sure why it's not showing. Um, yeah, I, I was asking about consistency on among the markers. I was wondering how you would, uh, do you have any statistical tests to check whether markers are consistent? Yeah, so that's what I asked them to use the comments with points, because that makes it very consistent. I tell them when you see this type of issue, do this. That's one thing that I do. And another thing is checking the marking of the first 10 or 20 booklets. That way you can calibrate and you see what they're doing. And if you realize that they're not very consistent with each other, then you tell them, okay, we need to adjust the marking and we need to make sure that you're both or one of the four of you are using the comments in the same way. I used to do that with four markers marking one question because it was, you know, 2000 students. That's a lot of students to go through. And we needed a very quick turnaround of less than a week. So we had four yeah. people marking the same question and because we were using these comments, it stayed extremely consistent. And actually, in those cases, if it's high stakes, they're told to not deviate from the preset comments. So if, if you see something that is out of you know, this list, create a tag that says to check or like that, and then we'll deal with those separately, just to make sure that we are very consistent. So, but but it's it's slightly different from having a rubric saying follow the rubric and trying to have procedures to ensure consistency. That's different to checking whether they are consistent. I still think it's important to have run some tests. Yes, and 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 we do. So the yeah, good thing okay. with Primark is that it's extremely easy to oversee what other people do. So the process that I do, and I I've been doing this for many years for TA training, is you mark the first twenty. You let me know that you finished. I check what you did. So I will check what all the four markers did and we see if it's consistent or not. And if it's not, you tell them to adjust. But then you can go at random. I go randomly check a few scripts marked by every person to see if it's consistent or if some mistakes in the marking arise. I've noticed sometimes that after a T have done 300 of them, they begin to mark something as wrong when it's correct or the other way around. And then I have to tell them, okay, this is happening. You have to go back and fix it. So yes, it's extremely easy to check what's happening because you don't even need to bother them. They don't even know that you're doing it. You just go through a random sample as they go and then you can tell them, okay, you need to address this issue now before everything's been done because before when it's on paper it's very difficult to do those checks now it's very very quick okay thank you if you have any uh, additional question questions please use moodle because uh, then after this session maggie and beatrice can um answer your questions and uh, discussion can be can be followed there is one more in the chat yeah yeah but we are but this, i'll quickly answer that one so um, please confirm if I'm understanding this correctly. So you're referring to a group submission uh, by students. And if they have submitted and then you add a new group member to that submission, does it reset the existing submission? Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Okay, so um, the answer is yes and no. So the way a group submission works is when you put a group of students together, it creates like one box for them to all put their submissions in. And this is specific to the online assessment. Um, so if what if the students all submit separately and then you put them in a box, all of those individual submissions do not go with them. If you have uh, one box where, for example, three students have submitted and then you add one more student to that box, the original submission stays and then that student will just have to either resubmit their work or submit to the box that they have all put in. Um, on a paper assessment, what happens is uh, that matching feature that I showed, you match more than one student to a submitted paper. So those group members can be edited and shifted around depending on if they're added you know, to the wrong paper or not, because that's just matching it to a paper. You can just unmatch them and match them to the correct one. That doesn't affect the submission in the same way. Thank you very yes. much. And um, you. as I said, you can follow the discussion in Moodle. And thank you all very much for- Thanks everybody. Uh, yeah. 
having this hour together. Bye.